as you see, uh, we're going to uh, talk in this lecture about the basic integration rules and techniques. And let me say that uh, this chapter that we're beginning our journey on is entirely about integration techniques. There's a lot of uh, uh, functions that we have not learned how to integrate yet, and uh, we'll see that we can do these things, things that seem simple in the past or would have seemed to be simple, but we don't have a technique to do that. Uh, to be successful in this chapter, there are some things that you must know. And uh, so I'm going to begin writing things that I expect you to know. I will assume that you know them when I ask, ask questions on the test. And, and the first three basic ones we'll come back to and I'll spend much more time on, but you certainly do know these. The integral, of u to a power with respect to u. Of course, normally we see x to a power, but we're talking about substitution many times, is uh, uh, u to the power n plus 1. Uh, and we offset that, of course, by a factor in front. And I usually put it in front, 1 over that power n plus 1. In other words, the reciprocal of the power, plus our constant integration and this, of course, only works if the exponent is not negative 1. In other words, we're not integrating u to the negative 1 or integrating 1 over u. We have a special form for that, and that's next. The integral of 1 over u with respect to u, we've seen this in the past, and that's the natural log of the absolute value of u, plus our constant of integration. And uh, next, the basic one, the integral of e to the u, with respect to u is nothing more than e to the u plus our constant of integration. Those I expect you to know. Now, following, there are uh, multiple trigonometric functions I expect you to know the integral to. Uh, so I'm going to say trigonometric integrals. And let me begin here. Uh, I'm going to put up several all at once, and uh, then I'll talk talk to them or about them, and then we'll go to some that are maybe a little more uh, less familiar, but we should know. Well, here are the first two. The integral of sine of u with respect to u is negative cosine of u plus our, a constant integration. And the integral of cosine of u with respect to u is equal to positive sine of u plus our constant of integration. Remember, we have to keep track that when we're integrating, the signs are just the opposite of what we do, what we get when we differentiate. So uh, recall that, please. Well, the next are the integral of secant squared u and the integral of cosecant squared u. The integral of secant squared u is tangent of u plus your constant of integration. And we recall that because the derivative of tangent u is secant squared u. Okay, that's the reason we remember that. Integral of cosecant squared u with respect to u is negative cotangent of u plus our constant integration. And once again, we know that because the integral of cotangent of u is negative cosecant squared u. Uh, so those come from remembering how we differentiate. So next we see the integral of secant u, tangent u with respect to u is just secant u plus our constant of integration. Once again, because the derivative of secant u is secant u tangent u. And uh, the integral of cosecant u, cotangent u is negative cosecant u plus our constant. Once again, because the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. Again, those come from being familiar with the rules of differentiation. The next two, as you see here, uh, the integral of tangent of u with respect to u, there's really two forms we can use. That's why I've indicated this. Uh, probably the top form is the most common for us. It's negative natural log absolute value of cosine of u plus c. Or positive natural log of absolute value of secant of u plus c. Likewise, you can see uh, the integral of cotangent of u is uh, one of two forms, the top form is probably the most common, is the natural log of uh, the absolute value of sine of u plus c, or alternatively, the negative of the natural log of the absolute value of cosecant of u plus c. 
Now, those were a, a little less familiar to us because they had to be developed in uh, Calculus 1. Uh, what you end up doing, if you recall, if we're looking at an integral of tangent of u, then we write tangent of u as sine of u over cosine of u, and we use substitution for cosine of u in the denominator. And when we do that, we have to offset with a negative and get a negative sine. Uh, we'll do this later to, as a reminder or in, an, in another lecture. Uh, but, but this is something I expect you to know. It's something that should have come out of Calculus 1 for, uh, with you. So you may have to uh, worry about re-memorizing some of these. Um, now there's one more pair of trig functions. Notice we've taken the integral of sine and cosine, the integral of tangent and cotangent uh, straight, plus the others in between. We have the integral of secant squared and cosecant squared, but we don't have the integral of secant uh, alone. So that's, that's actually the next pair. The integral of secant of u with respect to u. And this one is very important. We'll use it a lot. Is the natural log of the absolute value of secant of u plus tangent of u plus our constant integration. I'm afraid I'm going to run out of room over here on the, the right side of the page. Uh, so let me come down a little lower here. Let me come down below the integral of cosecant of u with respect to u is the natural log, excuse me, is the opposite of, so I've messed that up, let me start all over. Let me come over here. The integral of cosecant of u with respect to u is the opposite of, the negative of, the natural log of cosecant u plus cotangent u, cosecant of u plus cotangent of u, plus our constant integration. Now I must tell you, uh, th these I expect you to be familiar with, and of course the first line is, the, the first two lines uh, certainly are important. Uh, we use these two quite frequently. And then we use the ones on this left side more frequently than we use the ones that are on the right side. Um, and of course, the three that I put up here, these forms are very critical to us. That's what we use most frequently, but you need to be able to, uh, uh, you need to be familiar with all of them. Now, there are three more I need you to be aware of and be familiar with, and those are inverse trig forms. Let me write those up. Okay, you can see uh, we have uh, the, the first two of these are the most critical. We use them frequently. We use the last one of these three less frequently. And these are forms which we get an inverse trig answer. So when we have the integral of 1 over a square root of some constant squared minus some um, expression squared, variable expression, here we're saying u, uh, with respect to u, then the result is the inverse sine function of u over a plus our constant integration. And likewise, if we have the integral of 1 over a squared plus u squared without any square roots there, then the result we get there is 1 over the constant a times the inverse tangent of u over a plus our constant integration. u is the variable expression. And uh, lastly, and, and, and by the way, because we have a sum in the denominator, we could actually see that as a u squared plus a squared rather than a squared plus u squared, uh, either form. But of course, in the one above, if we had the u squared in front of the a squared, that is u squared minus a squared, that's different than a squared minus u squared. And the last addresses that to an extent. The last one that we see here is the integral of du over u times the square root of the variable expression squared minus the constant squared. So a little different form. Again, you should be familiar with these. Uh, that's one over the inverse secant of the absolute value of u over a plus our constant integration. So um, there is a form out there for you to print out 
that has these on it, and these are things I do expect you to know. So please, uh, if, if you have forgotten or uh, are a little rusty, make sure you print that out and begin the memorization. We're going to go to the next page and actually apply these forms um, in this section in this lecture. So uh, let me let me pause and get set up on the next page. Once again, I'm trying to emphasize that uh, the, I've written down five forms here, besides the trick forms uh, that I had on the previous page. We use these forms uh, repeated repeatedly, and notice. They're, they're written in terms of U's instead of X's because we're normally are, uh, you know, we don't, at this level, we don't integrate X to the second power with respect to X. We integrate things like uh, the square root of X plus 4 with respect to X. And so we have to rewrite in a form. We have to do a substitution. So all of these really are dealing with some form of substitution and we're trying to get them to look like this form. In fact, uh, we spend a great, let, let me write this down and then I'll read it to you. As I was just saying, we spend a, a lot of effort uh, and we will use all kinds of techniques to try to write our integrals in one of these forms because if we can accomplish that, we can complete the integration because we know how these integrals look when we're done. And then, we, of course, we resubstitute. So uh, that's the reason we use these over and over and over. Now, we can't always be successful, and there are other forms that we have to use occasionally. But uh, this is usually what we're trying to accomplish. Well, to illustrate uh, what I'm referring to, um, I've written three integrals across the top, as you can see, and uh, they are very similar. The only thing that's different is their numerator. Uh, four, the integral of 4 over x squared plus 9 with respect to x, and then the integral of 4x rather than 4 over x squared plus 9 with respect to x, and then thirdly, the integral of 4x squared over x squared plus 9 with respect to x. Now, uh, although the simplest integrand is the first one, the integrand is what we're integrating, uh, that's the simplest, but it's certainly not the, the first technique that we would normally think of. But I am going to uh, start with that one uh, to illustrate uh, what we do. So let's look at the integral of, let me separate these, we'll go through each one of them and they'll illustrate some techniques we're familiar with and maybe even a new technique uh, that we haven't seen before. Um, or we've forgotten. So number one, the integral of 4 over x squared plus 9. Well, the first issue that I notice here is there's nothing particularly special about that constant 4 in the numerator. It, I mean, we could leave it there, but because it's the same as 4 times 1 over that fraction, uh, we know that we can factor out that constant factor of 4. So now we're just worried about the integral, four times the integral of 1 over x squared plus 9 now, with respect to x. Now, here's where we have to be familiar with our different integration techniques. Um, if you'll notice that this is very similar, it is of the same form as one of the techniques or one of the forms that I illustrated earlier. That is the integral of du over a squared plus u squared, and that result was what? 1 over the inverse tangent of u over a plus our constant integration. So we would have to recognize that this is of that form. In fact, it is. Of course, the, you know, the denominator is a little uh, different form. That is, the variable is first and the uh, constant is second in the denominator of our problem. But that's not a big issue, as I mentioned before. So the way we would have to go through this is we need to identify our u and our a so we can ap apply this formula, if you will. So in, in our problem, what we would have is that our u is represented by x. So that is the u squared is x squared. And our a is represented by a 3, that is a squared is equal to 9. Now, 
uh, it's, that's not quite good enough because what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to write our entire integral in terms of uh, du. Okay, I mean we we've got a little bit of work to do here. So um, what we would normally do. So saying what we would normally do is we would begin our substitution, and, and I hope that we're familiar enough with this so we could do it rather rapidly, but I've rewritten what we had up above, and uh, we're going to replace u, um, uh, x, that is, with a u. So now our integral looks like 4 times the integral of 1 over uh, actually u squared, isn't it? Okay. And, uh, of course, we're replacing our um, 9 with a squared, so we have plus a squared. But the problem is that we still have a dx, and we've got to come up with a replacement for dx because we're integrating in terms, uh, uh, in terms of u. So we need to have that du here. Well, remember how this works. We go way back up here, and we use this information that u is equal to x. And since u is equal to x then the derivative of u with respect to x is equal to 1, or that is du is equal to dx. So we can do a straight replacement here and say, oh, well, this is 4 times the integral of 1 over u squared plus a squared du. Now we can use that formula, and that's 1 over a times the inverse tangent of u over a plus our constant integration. And then, of course, we go back and we put our real values in. You know, a is really 3, so this is 1 third times the inverse tangent of u, but u is x over a, which is 3, plus our constant integration. Oh, except that I left off my 4. Oh, that's, that was kind of dangerous, wasn't it? I left off my 4 that was in front of that integral. So the final answer would actually be 4 thirds times the inverse tangent of x over 3 plus our constant of integration. Now on the next page, we'll do the second one. Uh, and the second one probably is the one that we're most familiar with, period. Uh, but let's get set up on that problem. Okay, our second integral is the integral of 4x over x squared plus 9 with respect to x. Now, <clears throat> this, is a, this is what we call a u-substitution, the most frequently uh, frequent form of u-substitution type that we might have. And you'll recognize that if we replace x squared plus 9 with a u, then we can anticipate, because of the experience we've had in Calculus 1, that this will be a good substitution because our du will simply be 2x dx. And the issue is that we're very happy about the x portion of that, but the 2 is not a big deal for us. So uh, as, as you know, what we would end up doing is uh, we would rewrite in a fashion, let's, let's go through the steps here now, that we have that understood. We could, in fact, in this case, started having, well, let me write this down, the integral of 4x uh, over x squared plus 9 with respect to x. Now, most likely, what I would have done before I got started, uh, I would have factored that 4 in the numerator out, and so I would have had the integral of x over x squared plus 9 with respect to x. And now I know as a reminder, this, we're kind of starting like it's been a while since we've done this, then I would have done my uh, substitution, that is, I would, would have replaced the x squared plus 9 with a u. Uh, but the problem is that I still have x dx, and that's where this comes in. I really need, to, I, need I recognize that x dx uh, is not quite what I need, as I need a 2x dx. And so, I have could adjust this integral in this fashion. I could write my 2x here because I'm manufacturing that, if you will, but I've changed my integrand. And so to offset that factor of 2, 
I put a factor of one half in front. And so now when I go to integrate, notice, of course, that four times one half in the front is a two, and the two x dx can be replaced with, whoops, whoops, I'm sorry. I already replaced that x squared plus nine with a u, hadn't I? That two x dx now can be replaced with a du. That's what we did up here. So now I have the integral of 1 over du with respect to u. I mean, 1 over u with respect to u. And that is one that we're familiar with. Don't forget our factor of 2. This is what I was mentioning before. We're always trying to get things in this form. So we know the integral of 1 over u is natural log of absolute value. Of course, don't forget our constant integration. And then, of course, u we go back to and say, oh, well, that was really x squared plus 9. So this is 2 times the natural log of absolute value of x squared plus 9 plus our constant integration. And then sometimes you'll see an answer okay, uh, where you don't see any absolute values. And uh, you might question, well, I thought there was supposed to be an absolute value there. Well, there is, but in the case that we know our argument of logarithm is positive regardless of what x is, then we don't need the absolute values because it's certainly positive. And x squared plus 9 is positive for all real numbers. If x is positive, then we have a number bigger than 9. If x is negative when we square it, we have a number bigger than 9 when we add 9. Even if x is 0, then we would have a 9. And so x squared plus 9 is always positive. This is the way the answer probably would be left. Okay, we'll set up on the next page for our third example, comparing these three integrands, uh, and then we'll move on to some other types of examples. Okay, our third one of these that we were comparing, uh, the difference here is we have a 4x squared in the numerator, so the technique that we used last time uh, letting u be x squared plus 9 just won't work here because du would be a 2x. And we can't manufacture more variables. We can only manufacture the constant factors. So we have a little different problem here. Now, there's a tip-off on this one, and it's a tip that I want you to remember. Okay, When we're looking at a integrating a rational function, that is polynomial divided by polynomial. When we're looking at integrating those, if the rational function is improper, then we can try using long division. And here's what means the improper. It's when we compare the degrees. If the degree of the numerator is equal to or greater than the degree of the denominator, that means we can actually do a division. If we have 4x in the numerator, we can't divide x squared into a 4x. But if we have a 4x squared in the numerator, x squared will go into that, in, at the x squared of the denominator. So we're going to do a long division here. And so when we do a long division, remember, it's the compared degrees. That's the, uh, I've let you make more notes than this, but compare degrees of the numerator and denominator. And in this case, of the three that we saw, this is the only one that that's the issue for. So here's how we're going to do that. We're going to take the x squared plus 9, and we're going to divide it into 4x squared. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of time here, and normally when we do something like this, we want to account for all of the missing terms or missing powers of x just so that we have a place to put things. So I'm writing 4x squared as 0x plus, uh, 4x squared plus 0x plus 0. So we look at the x squared, how many times, we look at this x squared, how many times will x squared go into 4x squared, and it goes 4 times. That is, 4 times x squared gives us the 4x squared. So we have a place for, for constants, it's out here at the end, and then we multiply the divisor by the 4. So we say 4 times x squared is 4x squared, and then plus 4 times 9 is 36, and we'll put the 36 under the constants. And then we subtract. Well, 4x squared subtract 4x squared is 0, and 0 subtract 36 is negative 36. So what this means, see the significance of this, we'll come over here, the significance of this 
is it means that 4x squared divided by x squared plus 9 is the same as our quotient 4 minus our remainder. Our remainder is 36, and so we'd say plus negative 36, but I'm going to write it as a minus 36 over x squared plus 9, our divisor. Okay, that's what that means. So that gives us a new breath of life trying to integrate um, the above integral. That is, if we look at the integral of 4x squared over x squared plus 9 with respect to x, then that's the same as the integral of 4 minus 36 over x squared plus 9. So we can actually break this into two integrals. That is, the integral of 4 with respect to x, which is easy, minus the integral of, um, and let's go ahead and factor that 36 out. So the integral of uh, minus 36 times the integral of 1 over x squared plus 9. Now, this is obviously simple, okay? That part's simple. And this part is of that form, the integral of 1 over a squared plus u squared with respect to u, which is 1 over a times the inverse tangent of u over a that we just did. And that was where, um, of course, u is x and a is 3, and we found out also that du was dx, and so everything worked out great. So what we end up here then with is the integral of 4 with respect to x, which is 4x, minus 36 times the resulting integral of 1 over x squared plus 9, which was 1 over a, or that's 1 third, times the inverse tangent, of u over a, which is x over 3, plus our constant integration. And as we simplify, then we get 4x, and minus 36 times 1 third is, one, is uh, 12, isn't it? Whoops, so minus 12. Okay, so that doesn't look too bad. Times the inverse tangent of x over 3, plus our constant of integration. So here we used a combination of techniques, but the big deal is that we took that improper fraction that we were integrating and wrote it into a quotient plus a proper fraction, and uh, we were able to complete from there. So uh, four very similar integrals with uh, wildly different techniques of integrating, all of which we should be somewhat familiar with. Okay, we're going to uh, look at another technique, another example on the next page. So as I get this problem set up, uh, let's, uh, let's go about doing our business there. Okay, in this uh, new example, uh, we're asked to evaluate the integral of uh, x plus 3 divided by the square root of 4 minus x squared with respect to x, of course. And uh, it might be normal to set out and think, well, what if we let u be 4 minus x squared? And so we'd have uh, 1 over the square root of u, uh, which uh, we could probably integrate if that's all we had to worry about integrating, if it was with respect to u. But if we let u be 4 minus x squared, you can determine real quickly that our du would involve a negative 2x. And um, the numerator has the supplied x we need, but it has this extra plus 3. And so that kind of causes a, a little uh, bit of problem that it won't work directly. But if we could separate that x from the 3, then we could use that type of substitution. So this leads us to try something that's a little different. And um, this is another technique that you ought to keep in mind. It won't always work, but uh, I think it will work here. So let's uh, look at this integral, the integral of x plus 3 over the square root of 4 minus x squared. And, of course, that's with respect to x. Now, this technique 
uh, is all about separating, if you will, uh, a fraction, breaking a fraction into more than one fraction without doing division. And uh, in this case, uh, the numerator being two terms, we could actually break this into x over the square root plus 3 over the square root. So we can actually create two integrals. That is the integral of x over the square root of 4 minus x squared with respect to x plus the integral of 3 over the square root of 4 minus x squared with respect to x. Well, a, a, another step we could take, so this very first integral is one that I'm kind of happy with because I can deal with that, I'm pretty sure. So let's, let, I'm just going to rewrite it. Um, this may not be necessary, but I'm going to. I'm going to write this as uh, x times 4 minus x squared to the power of negative 1 half with respect to x. And in this second integral, I'm going to factor out the constant 3. And I'm going to have the integral of uh, 3 times the integral of 1 over the square root of 4 minus x squared with respect to x. Now, in this, um, in this left integral, I'm thinking that I'm going to put this in the form of the integral of u to the n du. And then I know when I integrate that, that's 1 over n plus 1 times u to the n plus 1. Plus, of course, our constant integration, but I'm going to wait. So I think I can get that form by simply saying uh, u is 4 minus x squared. And from that information, we can determine that du is actually negative 2x dx. And uh, we already have the x up above. Okay, so I'm going to come below, and I'm going to do this substitution. So I'm going to replace the 4 minus x squared with a u. And so that we have a u to the negative 1 half. And I'm going to replace the, um, the x dx, which I have. See, I already have an x dx in there, but I need to get a du. So I'm going to put a negative 2 factor with that x dx, but I have to offset that by a negative one-half. I can't really change my integral. And so uh, if I come down, then I have a negative one-half times the integral of u to the negative one-half. Uh, negative 2x dx is my du, and so I've been successful in changing that form. Now, I, I, normally I'm, I'm trying to present this in a way uh, so that you kind of see my train of thought. Uh, normally, we'd go off and do one integral and do the other integral, but uh, now what I want you to be concerned with is this other integral before we get too far away from what we were doing. And this other integral is of the form, the integral of du over the square root of a squared minus u squared. And remember, that integral is the inverse sine. So that's the end. The result of that is inverse sine of u over a plus our constant integration that we'll deal with at the very end. Now, in this case, of course, the u has to be x and the a has to be 2. But if the, the u is x, then du is in fact directly dx. And of course, a, a squared, and we understand that, a squared would be 4, and u squared would be x squared. So keeping that in mind, then this integral becomes, let's see here, plus 3 times. Now, uh, we have an exact match, so we're actually replacing, um, we, we actually have 1 over the square root of a squared minus u squared du because we can replace dx with du and so on. So when we uh, we can go directly to our integral, we don't have much to worry about here, is we would get the inverse sine of x over 2. And I'll put my plus constant integration way out here. Um, 
Yeah, we've got to go back and finish the integral that we started over here. So let me rewrite this business in here. <laughs> well, the integral we started, when we integrate u to the negative one-half, remember we already have this negative one-half factor out here. We increase the exponent by one, and so that gives us a positive one-half, and we offset that with the reciprocal of that new exponent, which is a two. So we offset that with that factor of two. Um, and probably I could have done that with what I wrote down already, but, but I've done this. Plus three times the inverse sine of x over two plus our constant integration. And of course, negative two times, uh, I mean, negative one half times two is a negative one. And uh, u is really uh, way up above. u is what? Four minus x squared. And that to the one half means square root of. So this is the negative of the square root of 4 minus x squared plus 3 times the inverse sine function of x over 2 plus finally our constant integration. So yes, it wasn't particularly difficult. It was difficult to recognize a technique. And then all this all came from separating the fraction so that we could actually created two integrals. Okay, we're ready to uh, look at an additional problem um, that is yet a different type of technique. In our next example, uh, you can see we're to evaluate the integral of 1 over the square root of negative 7 minus 8x minus x squared. And the secret to this is a technique uh, called completing the square. It uh, may not be apparent yet, but what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to put this in the form of 1 over the square root of a squared minus u squared. And the u is actually going to be a binomial. Uh, for example, in this case, it's actually x plus 4. <laughs> this technique required, and, and so this is not something that we probably would have thought of doing on our own, but once you see the technique, that's the idea behind a lot of this, is uh, then hopefully you can reproduce it or you have a tool to try in the future. So here's, here's the approach. We're going to take this negative 7 minus 8x minus x squared, and we're going to complete the square on it, which means we're going to write... Uh, at least part of this, as a binomial squared. Well, normally the way you deal with this is, uh, let's, let's first look at the two terms involving x's. So this negative x, and then we look at plus. I'm going to write it this way so that we can see what's going on. Uh, negative 8x minus x squared. Now the problem is, is what we want to do is create a trinomial here the factors as a binomial squared. In fact, x plus 4, the quantity squared. But we can't complete the square whenever we have uh, anything that a coefficient other than a coefficient of 1 in front of x squared. So what we'll do in this case, in this particular case, is we'll factor out a negative 1. Uh, in fact, rather than saying plus, let me write, excuse me, negative 7 minus uh, x squared plus 8x. I'm changing the form around while I'm doing this. Uh, so that's still negative 7 minus x squared minus 8x. It's still what we had. Now to complete the square, remember, you take the coefficient in front of the first degree term. That is in front of x to the first power. You take that and you divide it by 2. And that gives us a 4. And then we then we take that 4 and we square it and it gives us a 16. So that means we need to put a plus 16 right in that position so that we'll have a perfect squared trinomial. Well, we need to be a little bit careful here. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay. So we have x squared plus 8x plus 16. But of course, that's not what we started with. We have an extra piece that wasn't in there before. But because we have a minus in front of that 16, I mean, in those parentheses, what we really added was a 
negative 16. So we're going to offset that by putting a plus 16 here. And you'll notice then those offset each other because we'd have negative 7 minus x squared minus 8x minus 16 and then plus 16 on the outside. So that's exactly what we started with. Well, now we can take, there's a couple things we'll do now. This negative 7 plus 16 is actually a 9, isn't it? So this becomes 9 minus x squared plus 8x plus 16. But that trinomial is a perfect square trinomial, which means when we factor it, it's a binomial square. In fact, it is x plus 4, the quantity squared, which you could certainly verify that. Now, now we're ready because what we have done is that we, now we can rewrite our integral. Okay, here's what we started with. We're to evaluate 1 over the square root of negative 7 minus 8x minus x squared with respect to x. But we've rewritten that radicand as uh, 9 minus x plus 4 the quantity squared. So then our integral really, when we just read that, all we've done is rewritten it. It's the same thing. But we have the integral of 1 over 9 minus x plus 4 the quantity squared. Now, <clears throat> this is of that trip form. And right? let's note here, this is the same form as 1 over, oops, with respect to x here, 1 over the square root of a squared minus u squared with respect to u. And remember, that's an inverse tangent. That's the inverse tangent of u over a plus a constant c. Well, so that is this. Here is the idea. We're going to let u be x plus 4. And under those circumstances, of course, then, the u is just dx. So we can go straight to the integral of 1 over the square root of 9 minus u squared du. It's directly. Okay? Well, that means that we get the integral, excuse me, we get inverse sine of u over a but, of course, A is 3, isn't it? I didn't write that down previously, but uh, A squared is in the place of 9, or 9 is in the place of A, uh, a squared, so we have A is 3. So we have inverse sine of U over A, or U over 3, plus their constant integration. But U is X plus 4. So the result here is the inverse sine of the fraction u, excuse me, x plus 4, x plus 4, divided by 3, plus our constant integration. So there's the result of this, and that technique, of course, is completing the square. And you can see that that might be useful in other cases similar to this. Well, uh, we're going to continue looking at additional examples. Uh, the next one's a little more exotic. We'll see that on the next page. In this uh, example six, we're going to use a technique uh, called add and subtract terms in the numerator. And uh, we're asked to evaluate the integral 1 over 1 plus e to the x with respect to x. And we kind of run out of ideas real quickly here because about the only thing that seems reasonable is to let u be equal to 1 over x. I mean, excuse me, 1 plus e to the x. But if we did that, that would require that du actually be e to the x dx. And we don't have an e to the x in the numerator, so this technique of substitution is not going to work for us. Uh, now, what we would like to do is actually manufacture an e to the x in the numerator that we don't currently have. One way this could be done, and uh, obviously this doesn't work all the time, but what we could do here was take our beginning, our actual integral that we're supposed to work on, 
and uh, let's do this. Let's let's uh, in the numerator. Let's just create an e to the x. But now, if we do, we have to offset that and actually subtract the same e to the x. Uh, and that's all over 1 plus e to the x. Now, what you'll see here, of course, is that we can now break this. We've seen this before. We can now break this integral into a couple of integrals. We could break this fraction apart. We could write this as the integral of 1 plus e to the x over the denominator 1 plus e to the x with respect to x. And then we could subtract the integral that was just e to the x over 1 plus e to the x with respect to x. Now, here we're in a good, a good position because in the first integral, 1 plus e to the x over 1 plus e to the x is just 1. So this is the integral of 1 dx. And in the second integral, we'll let u be that denominator like we had hoped to do before. And so du is, in fact, e to the x dx. So when we go through that substitution idea, 1 plus e to the x is the denominator here. So we have 1 over u, and e to the x dx is actually a du, the e to the x dx that we have there. So now we can integrate quite easily. The integral of 1 with respect to x, of course, is x. And uh, the integral of 1 over u with respect to u is natural log of uh, absolute value of u plus our constant of integration. But, uh, of course, u was 1 plus e to the x. So this is a natural log of absolute value of 1 plus e to the x plus a constant integration. Well, now, e to the x is going to always be a positive value. And so 1 plus e to the x is always positive. So we might write our final form as x minus natural log of, and we can withhold the absolute values in this case. They're not actually required. So we've done this by a little technique of adding and subtracting terms in the numerator. Well, in this next example, um, we're to evaluate the integral of cotangent of x times natural log of sine of x dx. And quite frankly, it's not unusual that we're at a loss of things to try many times. Um, and, and so we start struggling. And substitution is something that we try a lot. And so we might say, oh, well, why don't I let u be equal to cotangent of x and see where that leaves me. But the derivative of cotangent of x is actually negative cosecant squared x, isn't it? So we'd have a du is negative cosecant squared x dx. And of course, you can see in our integral, we have nothing to work with there. We don't see anything that looks any close to a negative cosecant squared x. And so that substitution won't work. Now we can try letting u be sine of x, but we could also try letting u be equal to the natural log of sine of x. Okay. And uh, if we found du in this case, that is, if we found the derivative of u with respect to x, well, the derivative of natural log is 1 over. So we would actually have 1 over the sine of x. But then we have to take the derivative of what we're taking the log of. That is, we're using the chain rule. And the derivative of sine of x is, in fact, cosine of x. So we would have times cosine of x, and then, of course, dx. And so when we see that in a simplified form, du is really nothing more than cotangent of x dx. And that fits us perfectly, doesn't it? So what we're going to end up doing, we're thinking in these terms, we're going to replace natural log of sine x with au, au to the first power. And then cotangent x dx that we have up above is nothing more than du. So we have nothing more here than the integral of u with respect to u.
Uh, so, of course, how would we integrate that? Well, we increase the, we'd get one half u squared plus our constant integration. And of course, u is the natural log of the sine of x. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here the way we write our answer. Um, some book, some software is very picky. In this case, we ought to be able to get away with saying that we have the natural log of sine of x, and it's that natural log of squared. Don't, don't put uh, the square on the parentheses of the logarithm. That would say logarithm of sine squared x. So we have to be a little bit careful about the way we wrote this answer. Now, what I'm saying is don't write one half times the natural log of sine of x and putting the square there. Because that's saying we're squaring sine and then we're taking the natural log. So that would be an incorrect way to write this. You, you might be able to get away with saying one half times natural log squared of sine x, just like we do with the trig functions. But I think, uh, I think I would prefer that that would be all right, but I think this is the safest way to leave your answer right there. Well, on, on the next page, what I'd like to do is give some kind of summary of what we've been doing here, um, and, and maybe the next couple of pages, uh, just to try to bring it all together. These are things that we've a little twist, a little, a few new techniques, but using old techniques at the same time that we're used to. Let's go to the next page. So, like I said, this is more or less a summary or kind of some observations in general. Um, we didn't look at a problem like this if we were asked to integrate 1 plus e to the x, the quantity squared. Uh, the idea of expand is, uh, what I mean here is we could actually square that 1 plus e to the x. And if we did, we would get 1 plus 2 times e to the x plus e to the power 2x. Uh, make sure that you understand that that's what we would get. But now we could certainly integrate each of these terms, and when we're integrating the e to the 2x, we'd have to use some substitution. But that's a technique that we should be somewhat familiar with, and, uh, and on occasion try that. Even if we had the power 3, we could do it. If we had the power 4, we would be a little bit stretched. Because the next technique is separating the numerator, as we've seen an example of. On occasion, as we see here, on occasion, um, we can take a fraction that we're integrating. That's you know, what we're integrating. It's called the integrand. And uh, we can break that uh, integrand into more than one fraction. And on occasion, that's very useful. Uh, what I mean by that here is we, we saw this example. We could say that's the integral of 1 over x squared plus 1 with respect to x and then plus the integral of x over x squared plus 1 with respect to x. And in the first integral, the integral of 1 over x squared plus uh, 1 with respect to x, that's a form that is inverse tangent result. And in the second case, we could certainly use a substitution for x squared plus 1, and du then would be 2x dx, which we could manage. So after we broke this apart, we could use two different techniques to finish the problem. Uh, another example that we saw was uh, dividing uh, an improper rational function, doing a division. Uh, let me put up an example of that, just as a reminder. <laughs> Uh, in the case, uh, the example we're looking at now, we have the integral of x squared plus 2x minus 1 over x plus 4, and uh, that integrand is an improper rational function. That is, the uh, degree of the numerator is equal to or bigger than the degree of the denominator. And whenever that happens, we can actually perform a long division. That is, we can divide the x plus 4 into the x squared plus 2x minus 1. And, and when we do that, when we make that x division, 
we would end up with a quotient, that is, when we divided, we would get an x minus 2, and then we would get a remainder of 7. And so we'd write that as plus 7 over our original divisor, x plus 4. So that's the result of our long division. And then you can see, in this case, we could break that into two integrals. That would, one would be the integral of the x minus 2 with respect to x, and the other one would be, add to that, the integral of 7 over x plus 4 with respect to x. And of course, in the first case, that's a simple uh, integral of a polynomial. In the second, we would use regular substitution where u is x plus 4, so we would have uh, a 1 over u form, and the result would be a natural log. So uh, that was the idea that we used uh, earlier about uh, doing division if we have an improper fraction. Um, let's see, what else did we do? Oh, we used complete the square, didn't we? Okay, so uh, let's look at that next. Here we have the integral of 1 over the square root of x squared minus 2x. And uh, the radicand under the square root down there, x squared minus 2x, we've seen an example that um, occasionally we can complete the square on a polynomial, uh, in this case a second degree polynomial, and that's normally what we'd be working with. Um, and, and the result we would get would be something that we could integrate using the inverse sine function or maybe the inverse trig function even. Um, but uh, let's see what would happen here. We went through this process, and I'll just remind you of the process, is that we would end up uh, looking at that denominator, excuse me, that radicand, what we have under the radical, and we would, we would decide, okay, to complete the square on x squared minus 2x, I'm going to have to extend this probably, uh, we take half of the negative 2, so we'd say 1 half of the negative 2, and of course that's a negative 1. And then we'd take that resulting negative 1 and we'd square it, and that would give it, whoops, and that would give us a positive 1. So we need to add a 1 here. Um, whoops, I don't have a good example. I apologize for this. Um, this is a bad example. Let me, let me let me rewrite this example. My apologies completely. Okay. Let's say we have the integral of 1 over the square root of, say, 2x minus x squared with respect to x. And so what we would end up doing in this case, uh, and it's not clear why I thought that was a bad example, but uh, uh, let's just proceed with this we would need to factor out the uh, negative 1 from the minus x squared, but we have to do that for the whole, uh, all of the terms involving x. So when we did that, we'd have a negative of x squared minus 2x. Okay. And uh, now we're going to complete the square. So the x squared minus 2x is what we complete the square on. So just as it's, I was starting a while ago, we would end up with a negative 1. And uh, when we take half of negative 2, and we would square that negative 1, and we'd get a positive 1. So that means inside those parentheses, we would have the square root of negative of x squared minus 2x, but we're adding a 1 there so that we will, okay, inside those parentheses. But since it's inside the parentheses, uh, we actually are subtracting a 1. So we add a 1 on the outside of those parentheses. Now, the result of that is that we can now rearrange and factor. So what we end up with, I keep forgetting that dx, what we end up with is a square root of the plus one we have at the end will move to the front, and then we have a minus, but inside those parentheses, x squared minus 2x plus 1, that will factor as an x 
plus one, uh, x minus one, pardon me, the quantity squared. And now that's of the form, that's of the form, which we're not finished here, I'm just reminding you, of the form of one over the square root of a squared minus u squared. And we'd have to go through all of the process to complete it, but once we get this form, we could do that. So that's the idea of completing the square. Let's see, what else did we see? Oh, we saw add and subtract terms in a numerator. Well, let's look at that on the next page. Okay, uh, the technique here again, is we're going to use, you'll see how it will work a little differently than what we did with this before, uh, add and subtract terms in the numerator. So we might look at this and decide, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could let u be x squared plus 2x plus 1, that denominator. If we did that, though, we would have du as 2x plus 2 uh, times dx. And, of course, we don't have the plus 2 in our integrand. So what we, would, what we might try, this is what we might try, is that in that numerator we could say, oh, 2x plus 2. We could create that, but if we did, we'd have to say subtract 2 as well so that we didn't really change it. And, and then after we accomplished that, or after we wrote that down, we could come in here and we could break that into two integrals. That is, we could integrate uh, 2x plus 2 over x squared plus 2x plus 1 with respect to x, and minus the integral of 2 over x squared plus 2x plus 1 with respect to x. Now, in, in this case, we could use u substitution here. I mean, on this, on this part, we would use u substitution, just as we started to do before uh, we did, broke this apart. In this, in this case, we might note that, okay, we might note that this denominator actually could be factored as x plus 1 the quantity squared. And if we did that, then we could use u substitution here, okay, where we let u be x plus 1. And so we, uh, and du, of course, then would just be simply dx. And so we would actually have the integral of u to the negative 2 du, and we could complete it from there. I, I'm not trying to complete these. I'm just trying to give you the idea of how occasionally uh, we can use these techniques. Um, even in this case, we might have been able to get it into a form. Uh, well, I'll leave it at that. But something that we haven't looked at uh, so far is uh, using uh, trig identities. And, um, you know, let's just kind of make a note of this while we're here. Um, using trigonometric identities. Sloppy, I apologize. Okay, we might have something that looks like the integral of cotangent squared x with respect to x. And we don't have a form for that. But we could use one of the Pythagorean identities for cotangent squared. We could actually replace cotangent squared x with cosecant squared x minus 1. And we have a form for cosecant squared x. See, then we would think of this as the integral of cosecant squared x dx minus the integral of 1 dx. And we have a form for this, we have a form for this, and so we could complete it after that. Um, another technique that is used frequently is uh, still using the idea of, uh, of uh, some trig identities, but a little technique that we use when we were proving trig identities as well. We'll see that one on the next page. Now, I've labeled this multiply by a special form of 1, 
which can sometimes work outside the realm of trig functions. But we've seen this idea when we were proving identities in trigonometry, and the issue is 1 plus sine x in the denominator, u substitution is not going to work at this point, and there's not a whole lot we can do with 1 plus sine x. Now if we had 1 minus sine squared x, we have a replacement for that. And so that is the idea here. What we'd end up doing is we would take this 1 over 1 plus sine x, and we could multiply the denominator by 1 minus sine of x. That creates something. We can, it's better to have a, a denominator that's a single term because we have more options then. And uh, then we could, uh, then we'd also have to multiply the numerator by the same thing. That's what I meant, multiply by a special form of 1. Because it's, this, of course, is just a 1 there. Uh, after we did this multiplication, we would have a denominator that was 1 minus sine squared x. And our numerator, of course, would be 1 minus sine of x. And the, the reason I did this, remember, is I was trying to get a denominator that was a single term. 1 minus sine squared x could be replaced with cosine squared x. And when I replace it with cosine squared x, then I have more opportunities. Because then I could break this fraction into uh, two fractions. That is, we could write it as 1 over cosine squared x. minus sine x over cosine squared x. And then that would allow us to break it into two integrals. And uh, the, uh, 1 over cosine squared x is actually secant squared x. Minus the integral of sine x over cosine squared x. Now here we have a form, say we have a result, we, we should know what the integral of secant squared x is, and in this case we could use u substitution. We could let u be cosine squared x, excuse me, u be cosine of x, and so our denominator is u squared. And if that was the case, du would be negative sine x dx, and we do have a sine x up in the numerator to work with. So we could use regular u substitution there. Um, again, I'm not completing these. We've had enough examples. I'm just trying to refresh your memory of the different techniques. Now, obviously, I can't show you everything that you might run into, but you now have plenty of, of forms and things to try and experiment with as you go through these problems. Uh, and in the next section, then we'll start focusing on techniques that we've never seen before at all. Well, that's the end of this lecture. Good luck on your homework.